Well, it's really good to be with you today. I th really, really want to thank you for having us out here to speak. And I want to start by uh, discussing why is it that we would have a conference like this? Why is this so important when we have all these different, all these different issues going on in the world today, all these different problems? If you think about it, the United States of America, we have the most churches, the most seminaries, most Christian colleges, Christian bookstores and resources of any nation. And yet for all of these Christian resources, it certainly seems like our nation is becoming less Christian every day, doesn't it? Now, why is it that for all of those, all of that Christian influence and the Christian heritage of this nation, why is it that we're rapidly becoming a pagan nation? What's going on? And shouldn't we really be worried about that kind of stuff rather than this academic origins type thing. Well, I want to suggest there's a connection. See, the real issue behind creation versus evolution and the real issue behind, well, really every problem we have in this nation is it's God's word versus man's word. It's a question of what is your ultimate standard? What is your ultimate commitment? I want to suggest to you that the loss of biblical authority is the root of, of the decline of Christian America. People are acting in a less and less Christian way because they don't believe that this is really true. And that starts with an attack on Genesis, the foundation of Scripture. This problem of God's Word versus man's Word has been an issue since the beginning. God created Adam and Eve. He told them, if you eat from that tree, you will surely die. And they decided they wouldn't listen to God's Word. They would determine truth for themselves. And they ate from that tree. And they, the process of death started immediately, of course, and they, they died. How about that? God was right. They were wrong. That's always the way it is. You see, we don't want to take God's word for things. We want to determine it for ourselves. And that's really what evolution is. It's man's idea of how life could come about apart from God, apart from a creator. And that's what I'm talking about when I talk about the word evolution. People sometimes equivocate and use that word in different ways. Uh, I'm talking about the idea that a single-celled organism billions of years ago diversified into all the different kinds of organisms we find today, including you and me. So you're related to an onion if evolution is true. Now, I don't believe that, but that's... That's what's claimed. What you believe about the past is going to influence your worldview today. If Adam is in your past, if God made you, well, then God owns you, and he's got the right to make the rules. If, on the other hand, ape is in your past, if you're just rearranged pond scum, well, you own yourself. Why not make your own rules? And so the morality that we get is connected back to origins. It really is. Beliefs have consequences. If creation is your belief about how things came to be, you're going to have consequences for that. If evolution is your belief about how things came to be, you're going to, there's going to be consequences for that too. If, if God's word is true, if creation is really true, you're going to have laws because we have a lawgiver, right? And so God, and we, have to, we have to do what he says. He made us in his image. He's revealed himself to us and so on. He'll hold us accountable for our actions. We have a good reason to obey God's laws. Marriage. Where does the idea of marriage come from? That goes back to Genesis. God created marriage. He created the family unit. He did that back at creation, back at Genesis. Uh, standards, meaning of life. Why is it I can't go out and just shoot somebody that I really don't like? Well, it's because that person's made in God's image. You can't destroy what's made in God's image, not at all. And God's commanded us not to do that anyway. But you see, if evolution's true, then you have a counterfeit set of standards coming out of that. If evolution is true, then why would you have laws, right? I mean, there's not, there's not a fundamental lawgiver. We could make up laws for ourselves, but why should they be enforced and who decides what they are and so on? Evolution is all about the strong dominating over the weak. Why then would you have uh, laws to protect the weak from the strong, which is what laws really do, if you think about it. It's, they're anti-evolutionary or homosexual behavior, pornography, abortion, all these issues. I mean, if if marriage goes back to Genesis, but then Genesis isn't true, then marriage is without a, a, a rational foundation. It's just a cultural trend, and the culture changes. Why wouldn't the definition of marriage change? Oh, and that's not just a hypothetical issue, is it? That's something we're seeing in our, in our culture today. We're seeing marriage under attack. Abortion. Why not? If, it's, if evolution's true, get rid of spare cats, get rid of spare kids. Same difference. What's the big deal? if you're not made in the image of God. Jesus understood this, by the way. Jesus understood that these Christian doctrines go back to Genesis. They go back to creation. In fact, if you look in Matthew 19 as one example, uh, when the religious leaders came to Jesus asking him about divorce to explain marriage, he quoted Genesis 1 and 2. He, he used that history to explain 
why marriage is, a, is, an, is an important doctrine today and where that doctrine comes from. In fact, Jesus quoted about as much from Genesis as all the other books of the Bible combined. You think maybe he thought it was kind of important? See, it's foundational. These Christian doctrines, really every major Christian doctrine you can think of, has its origin, its root in Genesis, its rational foundation there. It's not that Genesis is any more inspired than any other book of the Bible. They're all inspired by God, but Genesis is foundational in terms of the, logic, um, the logical and historical basis for these things. Now, what's happened in our culture is these evolutionary termites have come in and they've eroded that foundation in Genesis in the minds of people. And people think, well, you really can't trust in God's Word anymore. You really can't trust because you can't trust in Genesis. So why would you have laws? And, you know, why, why would marriage be one man and one woman for life and so on? See, a lot of people don't get that connection, but it's a very crucial connection that we, under, that we understand that. You'll have a lot of people who say, well, we don't have time to worry about origins and academic stuff like that because, you know, hey, marriage is under attack in our culture, and we got bad laws on the books, and we got school shootings and things like that. It's terrible. Folks, there is a connection. Yes, those things are all terrible, but those are symptoms of an underlying problem, the rejection of biblical authority that begins when you attack God's Word at its foundation in Genesis. If evolution's true, then these Christian doctrines that stem from Genesis, they, they can't, you can't make sense of them. Now, I'm not saying that uh, evolution is the cause of all the problems in society. Sin is the cause of all problems in society. But evolution gives people a seemingly rational foundation for their sin, really. Because you don't have that foundation in Genesis that's, that says God has the right to make the rules. Our foundations are under attack, and if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? So it used to be you could say abortion's wrong, homosexual behavior's wrong, adultery's wrong. People would say, of course, I understand that because we had a common foundation on God's Word in this, in this nation because of our Christian heritage. Even non-believers had some degree of respect for the Bible. They understood it's historically true and so on. But today that foundation has shifted. People say, well, not according to my rules. And I'm sorry to say most Christians are in that category as well. Most Christians embrace the portions of the Bible that are amenable to their lifestyle. But that's not what God's called us to. And that's why a lot of times you'll find people who profess Christ, and I don't, I don't doubt the sincerity of their conviction in Christ, but they, may, they might say, well, but I don't believe in a literal genesis, and I think that's just a metaphor and, or maybe a parable, right? It's one of those poetic sections of the Bible. Well, Genesis isn't written that way. You know those verses you love to read before you go to bed, and so-and-so begets so-and-so, and they beget so-and-so? You know those genealogies that you love to read, I'm sure? like in Genesis 5. Well, those verses are there for a reason. They're there to tell us that Genesis is real history. That's why it gives us the names of these individuals that really lived in history. It tells us the names of their children. In some cases, it tells us how long they lived. Sometimes there's the span of time between parent and descendant and so on. Now, that's not a parable, folks. Parables aren't written like that. Parables, there was a certain man and so on. They don't have specific names usually, and they certainly don't have genealogies. Uh, it's not poetic literature like the Psalms, right? I mean, that would make a terrible poem, wouldn't it? It's not written that way. It's written as literal history. That's the way Jesus took it. That's the way I'm going to take it. And by the way, for those Christians who compromise, then I've got a question. Because you see, the Bible indicates that those genealogies lead all the way up to Jesus. Yeah? Jesus is descended from Adam. And so if you say, well, yes, I'm, I'm a Christian. I believe that Jesus, that's a real person, resurrected from the dead. Well, that's great. But then they say, but Adam, I think that's just a metaphor. Well, wait a minute. Jesus is descended from Adam. You're saying he's descended from all these people, descended from a metaphor? That's not going to work. You don't have to be a PhD in genetics to know you can't be descended from a metaphor. Doesn't work. And by the way, it's theologically significant that Jesus is descended from Adam, and so are we, because that makes him our relative. That's why he can be our kinsman redeemer. That's a theologically important concept in the Scriptures. That's why his blood on the cross can atone for our sins. The blood of bulls and goats can't atone for sins, the Bible says. They were used as symbols in the Old Testament, but they can't take away sin. Why? Because we're not related to them. Oh, unless, of course, evolution's true, and then that doctrine doesn't make any sense, does it? See, the gospel message goes back to a literal genesis because of what Adam did, that we need a Savior. Putting it another way, which Adam is non-essential to the gospel? Is it the first Adam that made it necessary for us to be saved? Or is it the last Adam, Jesus Christ, who made it possible for us to be saved? You see, without the first Adam, the last Adam really doesn't make any sense. And again, I'm not saying that you, you can't be saved 
apart from believing in a literal Genesis. I'm just pointing out that there, there would be an inconsistency in your belief system to, on the one hand, embrace Jesus. Praise God, I'm glad you do. On the other hand, you reject the logical foundation for why we need Jesus. The gospel is the good news. The good news is that Christ provides salvation from sin. But in order for that news to make sense, you have to understand the bad news. The bad news is that man is lost. We need to be saved from our sin. You see, if you don't start with the bad news, people don't understand why they would need a Savior. And that's why when we're witnessing to people, I think we need to back up and say, yes, I do have some good news to share with you, but first let me tell you the bad news. Let me tell you why you need a Savior. Let's take it back to Genesis. Let's take it back to the beginning. And that's why a lot of times when, when people go and they do, do, they do missions overseas and so on, I was talking with someone just a few minutes ago who does missions overseas, and he's found that the best way to do it is start with Genesis. How about that? You know, God did it that way. He started with Genesis. He knows what he's doing. The Bible really is the history book of the universe. It starts in the beginning God created, and it tells us the important events that have happened throughout history with respect to our relationship with God. A lot of people want to embrace the morality the Bible teaches, but they want to reject the history. But that doesn't make sense because the morality comes out of the history. Jesus put it this way. He's speaking to Nicodemus. He says, I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? That's a pretty good question, isn't it? He's, he's asking Nicodemus to be consistent. The Bible talks about earthly things, doesn't it? The days of creation, Noah's flood the confusion of tongues at Babel, and the Bible speaks of heavenly things, spiritual issues, morality, how to be saved. If you say, yes, I know the Bible teaches, you know, the days of creation, flood, and so on, but I'm not sure that's historically accurate. That's just sort of spiritual or something. Hey, if God didn't get the details right in Genesis, how can we be sure he got the details right on how to inherit eternal life? There is a logical connection there. People want to embrace the morality but reject the history, but you really can't be saved apart from history. Your salvation depends on the historical fact that Jesus Christ died and rose again. And that was made necessary because of what happened back in the Garden of Eden, what literally happened in history. Apart from the history that the Bible gives us, the salvation message, the gospel message, it doesn't make sense. But people want to have it both ways. Maybe to be academically respectable. I'm a Christian, but see, I, I embrace what the secular scientists teach, the evolution and so on. But when you try to make those two things agree, guess which one gets modified? Yeah. Oh, God didn't really mean he created. He, he's just a metaphor for evolution and what have you. No, 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 no. By the way, whichever one of those you modify is not the one that you ultimately have your faith in. It's not your ultimate standard because you can't, you can't modify your ultimate standard because you'd need a greater standard to tell you how to modify it, you see. And so that tells me what your confidence is really in. It's in man's word rather than God's word. And that's the battle that's been going on since the beginning. It used to be we used a highlighter to highlight the sections of the Bible we like. And now in far too many churches, we use a blackout marker to black out the sections we don't like. But God never gave us a line item veto on Scripture. He never did. And if you think about it, how did Jesus deal with compromise in his earthly ministry? When the religious leaders of his time came to him and, of course, they had distorted God's word, how did he respond? Did he say, well, that's not my personal opinion, but if you believe that, hey, more power to you. That's not how he responded, is it? Or did he say, well, it's not a salvation issue, so let's not worry about it. Let's just, you know, all hold hands and sing kumbaya, right? That's not how he responded, not at all. He said, it is written. Have you not read? Jesus took people back to the authority of the written word. He stood on the word. We need to stand on the word. Absolutely. You can think of the culture war that's going on today a bit like these uh, two castles. We've got Christianity battling secular humanism, the other great faith system in our culture today. Now, how are we fighting this war? Well, maybe not as effectively as we could be. We're maybe asleep at the helm, oblivious to the fact that there is a battle going on. We're shooting in the wrong direction entirely. We're popping some of these balloons. And there's nothing wrong with popping balloons, pointing out that abortion's wrong, racism's wrong, and so on. But my point here is that if that's all we're doing, those issues are going to keep coming back with brand new ones because we're not really hitting the problem. We're hitting symptoms. And then we're shooting ourselves. We're shooting our own foundation representing Christians who say, well, it doesn't matter what you believe about Genesis. That's all just a metaphor anyway. Boom. Damaging the, the very foundation of all Christian doctrines. 
And then the secular humanists are smart. They're aiming at our foundation, saying, you, yeah, you can't trust creation. You can't trust that God's word is true and so on. You know, because we know that millions of years of evolutions happened. Scientifically, science has proved it. Well, it really hasn't, but that's what they say, isn't it? That's the claims that are made. Well, how are we to uh, solve this problem? If we're going to get anywhere, if we're going to bring our culture back, well, we need to fight a little more effectively. It's okay to pop some balloons, nothing wrong with that. But we need to do more than that. We need to defend ourselves against these evolutionary arguments, which are, they're always either fallacious or based on false premise. It's not like there's a good argument for evolution. We need to point that out, too. It's a bankrupt conjecture. That's all it is. It's not scientific. It's certainly not biblical. We need to repair the damage that's been done to creation. Show people you can trust in God's Word. When you understand the science, hey, it lines right up with God's Word. My friend Dr. Snelling is going to talk about that in his session, about how geology confirms what God has taught in His Word. And I love how this is illustrated, too. You notice we're not aiming at the people. We're aiming at that castle, which represents an idea, the idea of secular humanism, really, based in evolution. The people there, those are not the enemy. Those are the victims. We want them to jump off and swim over here and join us on the castle of Christianity. We want them to get saved. We're not bashful about that. And by the way, not just, we don't just want them to be creationists. We want them to be Christians. We don't want them to just know that there's some sort of designer out there. By the way, the Bible says everybody already knows that anyway. Romans 1 makes that clear. Everybody already knows God in their heart of hearts. They just suppress that truth and unrighteousness. We want them to get saved. We're not bashful about that like, unfortunately, some Christians are. We want to shout it from the rooftops. God's Word is true from the beginning. You can trust it. The science confirms it. What about the time scale of creation? The Bible tells us God created in six days. Human beings were made on the sixth day, and from those genealogies are love to read, and so and so begets so and so. That's a few thousand years ago by adding up the ages. It's no harder than balancing your checkbook. Really. You got a calculator, it's really easy. Not a problem. But see, people think, oh, but the scientists tell us you know, it's millions of years. And you'll find that in the textbooks. I went through the public school system. I was taught that the fossils were deposited over millions of years. I didn't know Dr. Snelling back then, or he could have set me straight. But uh, see, I thought, well, yeah, you know, it's in the textbook. There it is. Millions of years. Well, my point is this. If you were stranded on a desert island and all you had was your Bible, would you ever conclude millions of years from Scripture? I don't think you would. Not at all. You'd say, well, six days, a few thousand years ago. Even if you don't add it up, you'd know it's not millions or billions of years for human beings. Not at all. There's only six days. You're five days before Adam. He's made on the sixth day. But people feel like they've got to get that millions of years in there because, well, the scientists just can't be wrong, even though they're wrong about the resurrection and you know, all those other things. But anyway, so where are you going to put the millions of years? You can't put it in between Adam and Christ because that would destroy those genealogies, right? You can't say in so-and-so begets so-and-so, and then millions of years later they beget so-and-so. That wouldn't make any sense. So people try and put the millions of years in the days of creation somehow. A few different ways they do it. They try to put it, maybe they say, well, the millions of years happened before the beginning which is pretty easy to refute because then the beginning really wouldn't be the beginning, would it? So that one never made a lot of sense to me. Or maybe there's a gap in between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2, the so-called gap theory. Yeah, but that doesn't work in terms of the way the, the Hebrew is constructed uh, with the vav, uh, disjunctive there in verse 2. One of the most common today is the idea that the days were, in fact, vast ages. That God really meant to say age when he said days. And so it's actually six vast ages of time. And they think that they can get then the secular time scale to line up, or the biblical one to line up with the secular one. It doesn't really work, though, because the order of events is different anyway. Evolution has fish coming uh, before fruit trees. The Bible has fruit trees coming before fish, and so on. The Bible teaches earth before stars. The secular order has stars before earth. So, so making the days long doesn't help you anyway. You might as well accept what God says in his word. But in any case, people will say, oh, but those, you know, they could have been millions of years. Now, there's really not any scriptural support for that. People will try and pull verses out of context. Like they'll say, oh, but Dr. Lyle, the Bible says one day is with the Lord is a thousand years. There it is, 2 Peter 3 8. I've read that. Have you read the second part of the verse? What does it say? A thousand, that one day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Cancels that right out, you see. It goes in the opposite direction. I find people only take the first part of the verse out of context, and it is out of context, because this isn't referring to Genesis anyway, the days of creation anyway. They, they take that first part out of context to try and make time longer. 
I've never heard anyone take the second part out of context and try and make time shorter, have you? You heard anybody say, well, there, you know, the Bible indicates 2,000 years between Abraham and Christ, but 1,000 years is this a day. It was really only 48 hours between Abraham and Christ, right? <laughs> and they'll do that. By the way, it's not saying a day is 1,000 years. It's saying it's like that to God in and, and, and 1,000 years like a day because he's beyond time. That's the real message there in 2 Peter 3, 8. God's beyond time. That's why he's patient. It's not giving you permission to change the word day everywhere you see it in Scripture to a thousand years, which wouldn't, and it wouldn't get you anywhere anyway. Because if you made the creation days a thousand years each, that'd make the earth about 12,000 years old instead of 6,000. It doesn't get you anywhere close to the millions of years that people think they need to add to the Bible. The Hebrew word for day is yom, and it's used over 2,000 times in the Old Testament of the Bible in singular and plural form. And I find it interesting. The only place people question, what does day mean, is in Genesis. Isn't that true? You don't hear people having, you know, sitting around having Bible studies. How long was Jonah really in the belly of the whale? Were those ordinary days or thousands of years? Who can say? We can't tell, right? He might have been in there a long time. What's a day? Or how long did Joshua take to march around the walls of Jericho? Were those ordinary days or thousands of years? We don't know. They can mean anything, right? People know better than that. Well, but Dr. Lyle, the Hebrew word for day can mean a period of time longer than... 24 hours, which it can in certain, in certain contexts, but its normal meaning is day. That's the word that they'd use to talk about day. Even our English word can mean a period of time longer than 24 hours. You might say, back in my father's day. Well, yeah, that would be a period of time longer than 24 hours. It wouldn't be millions of years, but it'd be longer than 24 hours. It took 10 days to drive across the Australian outback during the day. They got the word day used three times, and I'll bet you didn't have any trouble understanding it because you used context, used the surrounding words to constrain the meaning. That's always the case in Hebrew and any language. Let's do the same thing with uh, the Hebrew word for day. You're going to find, for example, that when the Hebrew word for day is used with a number, like the first day, the second day, the third day, is in an ordered list, it's always translated as a day, an ordinary day. How about that? 400, 400 times outside of Genesis 1, where we all agree what it means. We find that if evening and morning are combined, if there was an evening and a morning, what's, even if the word day isn't there, what's an evening plus a morning? A day, right? 38 times outside of Genesis 1, we all agree what it means. If I had evening with day or morning with day, either one of those would constrain the meaning to an ordinary day. And that happens 23 times each outside of Genesis 1, we all agree it's an ordinary day. If I said there was day, then there was night, contrasting night with day, you'd know I'm talking about an ordinary day, not a long period of time. Well, let's take a look and apply these contextual clues to Genesis chapter 1, see if we can figure out what God meant when he said day. Genesis 1 verse 5, and God called the light day. So there he's defining it for you. It's when it's light out. And the darkness he called night. So you have night associated with day. That's got to be an ordinary day. And you have evening associated with day. Got to be an ordinary day. You have morning associated with day. Got to be an ordinary day. You got evening and morning together, which constitutes an ordinary day. And you got a number with it first or one day got to be an ordinary day. How about that? It's pretty clear, isn't it? The first, there's no doubt the first day was an ordinary day. It's got all the contextual indicators that pretty much that God could have used. They're all there. What about the other days of creation? Evening, morning, number, day. 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 You sense some kind of a pattern there maybe? It's kind of like God saying, see, they're ordinary days, and in case you still don't get it, they're ordinary days. In case you're a little thick, they're ordinary days. In case you're really intellectually challenged, they're ordinary days. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. Oh, but Dr. Lyle, the sun wasn't made until the fourth day. So the first three days can't be ordinary days. Huh? The sun has very little to do with the length of the day. It's primarily the rotation of the earth. As long as you have a light source and a rotating planet, you're going to have day and night. Did we have a light source on the first day? And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Yeah, we had a light source. Was it a rotating planet? Yes, because there was evening and morning the first day. So you can have ordinary days. It's just God replaced that temporary light source with the sun on day four to be a permanent light bearer. I think maybe he did that so the Israelites would be less inclined to worship the sun as the ultimate source of life because God is really the ultimate source of life. So he displaced it, put, it on, put the sun on the fourth day. Of course, they ended up falling into that kind of worship anyway. Six days, yep. Six truly, really days, yep. You're sure it says six days? Yes. I wonder why he took so long. That's the question we should be asking. 
I mean, God's powerful enough. He could have created the whole universe in an instant. He really had to slow himself down to make in six days. And then he rested a day. Why did, why did God do that? Did, was he tired? Was he exhausted? Well, no. Does God need to rest? Of course not. But we do, and God knew that. And so he did that as a pattern for us. That's where we get our idea for a week. You know, all the other units of time have a basis in astronomy. A day, a rotation of Earth on its axis, a month, the amount of time it takes the moon to go through its phases, a year is the amount of time it takes the Earth to go around the sun. Where do we get the idea of seven days in a week? That's how long it took for God to create and rest. There's no astronomical basis for it. Back in Martin Luther's time, there were some people who were trying to squeeze the days of creation into one day. They're saying God actually created one day. I love how he responds to this. He says, how long did the work of creation take? When Moses writes that God created the heaven and earth and whatever is in them in six days, then let this period continue to have been six days and do not venture to devise any comment according to which six days were one day. I love this last part. He says, but if you cannot understand how this could have been done in six days, then grant the Holy Spirit the honor of being more learned than you are. <laughs> I love that quote. What about the scientific evidence, though? Hey, the scientific evidence is on our side, too, when you understand it. I don't want to spoil Andrew's fun, so I won't talk about a lot of this stuff, but uh, Dr. Snelling will come up and tell you, I'm sure, about some of the results of, like, the Rate Research Project, perhaps, or lots of evidence, lots of evidence that's consistent with thousands of years. The fact you find C14 in diamonds. C14 is an unstable isotope of carbon. It cannot last even one million years. And so the fact you find it in diamonds tells you they're thousands of years old. They can't be one to two billion years old, as evolutionists believe. Can't be, because that C14 would be gone. It decays away with a half-life of 5,700 years. And you say, well, there's, it, there's some kind of recharging mechanism. You're contaminating somehow. It's a diamond. How are you going to contaminate that? It's the hardest substance. Lots of stuff like that. And I'm sure Dr. Snelling will want to mention some more of those as well. My point here is that it's a question of ultimate standards. The secular scientists say the Earth's billions of years old. Take my word for it. God says, I created in six days. Take my word for it. Who are you going to trust? That's the real issue. For a Christian, that really ought to settle the matter. Now, we want to study up on some of the science, right? Because we want to show people, hey, science confirms thousands of years. There's no doubt about that. Science confirms creation. But really, the only way we, you, we could know is to go back in time, which we can't do, or ask somebody who was there, which we can do, because he's, he's written it in his word. Does it matter? That's my next question, because historically, a lot of the scientists came along, not all of them, but some of them said the Bible's not true, because you see these rock layers are far older than the Bible teaches, and a lot of the theologians, not all of them, but a lot of them said, well, maybe we can allow for that, because after all, it's not a salvation issue. I think they were well-intentioned, but it doesn't mean what they did was right. Is this a salvation issue? Well, no. Praise God, we're saved by God's grace, received through faith in Christ alone, and not through having perfect theology. But that doesn't mean we should continue to live in sloppy theology either. Six days is an important issue, but not a salvation issue. Just like gravity is an important issue, but it's not a salvation issue, right? You can not believe in gravity and still go to heaven. In fact, you'll probably get there a lot quicker that way, right? It's not a, it's not a salvation issue. It is important. It is an important issue. It's important for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's important because that's what God's Word teaches. In fact, it was inscribed by the very finger of God in Exodus 20:11. In six days, the Lord made the heaven and the earth and all that in them is. That's part of the Ten Commandments. It's written by the finger of God. It's the explanation for the Fourth Commandment. How about that? We better take that seriously. You see, the same Bible that says that God created six days also teaches virgin birth of Christ. Jesus turned the water into wine, walked on water, calmed the storm, raised the dead, raised himself from the dead. If you say, well, yeah, I know that the Bible teaches six days, but I'm not going to believe in that because what, what the secular scientists say. But folks, the secular scientists also say virgin birth and human beings, that's not possible. Water into wine, not possible. Resurrection from the dead, that's not possible. You'd have to reinterpret that too to be logically consistent. Well, that's just a spiritual sort of resurrection. Some people do that. You say, well, no, I, I believe in those portions, and I don't care what the scientists say because that was miraculous. Well, wasn't creation creation of the universe? If you don't think it's miraculous, let's see you do it. It's the same hermeneutic. There's another reason, though, why we don't want to compromise with the millions of years, and that concerns these fossils that we find all over the earth. And, of course, a fossil is a dead thing, turned to stone, permineralized. And if those fossils really are millions of years old, as the secularists teach, you've got a theological problem because you got death before Adam sinned. 
Everyone agrees that human beings don't go back, say, hundreds of millions of years. So you get a fossil that's 100 million years old. You got death before Adam's sin. But the Bible says, as by man, that death came into the world. The Bible teaches by man came death. Evolution and or millions of years teaches by death came man. They're opposites. Those two positions are logically contrary to each other. You cannot have both of them being true. People don't realize the devastating attack that millions of years is on the Word of God. According to Scripture, the world was a paradise when it was first created. God called it very good. Death is introduced as a temporary part of history, as a, as a right punishment for Adam's sin. It will be done away with in the future as a result of Christ's obedience. If, on the other hand, millions of years is true, death has always been, and there's no reason to think it won't always be in the future either, if it's not associated with the curse. Two different histories of death. You have the Garden of Eden, Eve saying, oh, Adam, this is such a perfect world, and Adam saying, yes, Eve, it's very good, just like God said. Might look something like that, maybe? Well, regardless, if the, if the fossils are millions of years old, and they were already there when God looked at the Garden of Eden, in fact, everything he'd made and called it very good, then you got the Garden of Eden sitting on top of millions of years of pain, death, killing, disease, and so on. You know, we find fossils with evidence of disease in them, things like cancer, arthritis, and so on. Were those part of the world? Were those already there when God created Adam and Eve and said, looked at everything he'd made and it was very good? Is disease very good? Cancer very good? God saw everything he'd made. By the way, it wasn't just the Garden of Eden. You look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. God saw everything he'd made. Behold, it was very good. Everything he'd made. So if the world was already full of death and suffering, pain and bloodshed, then God's definition of very good really isn't very good, is it? If that were the case, would we have any hope that heaven will be the paradise that we all pray that it is, that we all expect it to be. If God's definition of very good includes cancer, disease, things like that, if those were around before the curse. Now, some people have said, oh, but Dr. Lyle, it's just human death that was introduced at the time of the fall. But I don't think you can defend that scripturally. Romans 8 tells us that all creation groans under the bondage of corruption. It was made, it, see, all, all the world suffered because of Adam's sin because he was in, he was in charge. God put him in charge, and so everything, everything under him suffered. When the president makes a bad decision, everyone under the president suffers. When Adam made a bad decision, he was in charge of the whole world. The whole world suffered. It was cursed. And frankly, God instituted animal death at the time Adam sinned, right? Because it says that he provided skins of clothing for Adam and Eve. So those would be animal skins. God must have killed an animal or animals to provide skins of clothing for Adam and Eve. Now, some people have said, oh, but I've got you here, Dr. Lyle, because you'd have to at least have plant death before Adam sinned. But I got news for you. According to the biblical definition, plants are not actually alive. Isn't that interesting? And biologists use a different definition of life and death than the Bible uses. The Bible uses the word nephesh, nephesh kaya, living creatures, and that, apply, that term applies to human beings and it applies to animals. It doesn't apply to plants. Plants are never referred to as nephesh kaya. They're not, they're not living creatures. Oh, you can talk about a, a dead plant. You can talk about a dead battery, but that doesn't mean it was ever really alive. And plants are not really alive, not in the same way that, that we are. You, you know that difference, right? I mean, you come across a dead, a so-called dead tree in the woods. Well, that's nice. I think I might sit on that for a little while. Take a picture of it, put it over my mantle. But if you come across a dead animal in the woods, you say, oh, that's nice. I'm going to sit on that for a little while. Take a picture of it, put it over my mantle. <laughs> that's different, isn't it? Because this is, this is an intrusion into a world that was once perfect. I could imagine that in heaven, but I, not that. Because the curse is going to be lifted, you see, in the new heavens and the new earth. God made a perfect world. We ruined it by rebelling against him. But he'll make it right again in the future because of Christ's obedience. Six days versus millions of years. Really, it's the same issue as creation versus evolution. It's what is your ultimate authority? Is it God's word or man's word? And there are all kinds of other issues, like thorns. You know, we find thorns deep down in fossil layers that evolutionists say are 400 million years old. Now, if that's true, then when God cursed the ground and said, thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, Adam could have said, so what? Thorns have been around for millions of years. See, it wouldn't make any sense. We know thorns are after sin. They're a result of sin. They can't, therefore, be millions of years old. People think they can just pull away the six days and the rest of the scriptures will be uninfected. But the fact is... The Bible all hangs together or it all falls apart. You can't just remove pieces of it and expect it to still make sense, logically. What about the extent of the flood? Did you know you can't consistently believe in millions of years and a worldwide flood? 
because either the bulk of the fossils were deposited in that worldwide flood, with some afterwards, of course, or they were deposited gradually over the, over the millions of years. And because evolutionists need the millions of years, they have to reject the worldwide flood. A worldwide flood would destroy any previous fossil record anyway. And so there are people who are professing Christians who say, well, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm a Christian, no doubt about that, but, I, but the world's millions of years old, you gotta believe in the Big Bang and so on. I'm thinking of a particular uh, person who goes around preaching that, and he says, yeah, well, he says there was, there was a flood, but it was just a local flood, limited to the Mesopotamia Valley, is what he says. Now, when you hear something like that, you need to go back to the scriptures and check it out. What does the Bible have to say about the extent of the flood? Let's take a look. Genesis 6:17. God says, And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy, what, a few things here and there? No, to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from, from the local Mesopotamia Valley? No, from under heaven, under the sky. That's pretty much global, isn't it? And everything that is in the earth shall die. Genesis 7:19. Through 20, and the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail. The mountains were covered. Does that sound like a local flood to you? One that covers the mountains? Doesn't make any sense. Now, some people have said, oh, but all doesn't necessarily mean all, right? There's some, there's some circumstances where it can be more limited. Yeah, but not when it's doubled. When you have all and whole, which is actually the same word in Hebrew, when it's doubled like that, that is universal. That means all, everything. It's doubled for emphasis. All flesh died. Every creeping thing, every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life, all that was in the dry land died. Every living substance was destroyed. Noah only remained alive and they that were with him on the ark. See, the Bible's clear. It was a, it was a global flood. One that human beings could not escape. That's the way God's wrath is. You can't escape it. Unless it's, unless it's by God's grace. That's the only way you can escape God's wrath. By the way, you can't have a local flood that covers the high hills, right? Think about that. What would it look like? It would look like that. It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense, does it? That's not going to work. What about the rainbow? God's promise never to send another global flood, right? But if it's just a local flood, and God's promising never to send a local flood, then God's broken His promise thousands of times because we do have local floods. What about the ark? We don't know how long Noah took to build the ark. We know he had at least 100 years warning. But why would you spend all that time and resources to build something that massive, to take two of every air-breathing land animal and birds, by the way, for a local flood that you knew was coming? Why not just... I don't know, move, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, the Bible tells us the ark was to preserve their kinds on the earth. And so that tells us it was really a global flood. Well, I'm an astronomer. We have to do a little bit of astronomy here. Here we have a picture of the surface of Mars. You know, they've sent spacecraft there. They've, they've analyzed the rocks, and they've found that this area of Mars, certain areas of Mars are actually, they believe they're floodplains. They were once flooded. How about that? And a quote from a, uh, a newspaper here. It says, A flood of biblical proportions, enough to fill the Mediterranean Sea, gushed down from the highlands of Mars a billion or so years ago. The latest pictures from the Pathfinder confirmed Monday. Now, for those of you that may not know a lot about astronomy, Mars has, as far as we know, no liquid water on it at all. The conditions today aren't right to have at least fresh liquid water on it. There's not sufficient atmospheric pressure. And yet secular scientists are willing to believe in a flood of biblical proportions, no less, on a planet that has no liquid water. But they'll, they don't believe in a worldwide flood here on Earth, a planet that even today is over 70% covered with water. But they'll believe in a flood on Mars. Now, why is that? What's going on? Well, the Bible predicts that. You see, if you have the worldwide flood, all your evidence for millions of years is washed away. That's the bottom line. And the Bible predicted that. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their lusts and saying, where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. That's uniformitarianism. No worldwide flood, nothing like that. For this they willfully forget, or they're deliberately ignorant, that by the word of God the heavens were old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. It says people would be willingly ignorant of that worldwide flood. How about that? That's exactly what we're seeing today, isn't it? Just exactly what we're seeing. Well, they gave me 50 minutes, but a day is like a thousand years. <laughs> so, I'm just kidding. Let's, let's wrap this up here a little bit. You see, if you understand creation, 
then the gospel message makes sense. You're going to be much more effective in your evangelism, really. We need to be able to defend Genesis because that's the issue that's under attack today. That's where people are aiming their ammunition at God's Word. They're aiming it primarily at Genesis because those Christian doctrines crumble if Genesis isn't real history. Because without Adam, why do we need a Savior? If death preceded Adam's sin, then how can death be the penalty for sin? And if death isn't the penalty for sin, then why did Jesus die on the cross? How do we know He saves us if He didn't really pay our penalty? Hmm. See, God is a righteous God. And as a result of that, He will judge sin. We wouldn't want it any other way. You wouldn't respect a judge that let a criminal go with, for no good reason at all. God will judge sin. He's righteous. But He's also merciful, and He provided the way of escape when it came to the worldwide flood. The Bible says Noah was a preacher of righteousness. I'm sure he was out there preaching, come on board the ark and be saved. And of the, we don't know how many people were in the earth at that time, but it, it could have been billions of people. You work out the numbers, it is a rough estimation. It could have been billions of people. Of all those people, how many were saved? Eight. Eight received God's offer of mercy and were brought aboard that ark. And I think it's interesting, the Bible says that God was the one that closed the door on the ark. I think that's significant. God was the one that decided time of mercy over, time of judgment begins. And so you see, you can use creation and the flood and all this stuff. You can use this as an evangelism tool to teach people about salvation in Christ. That's one of the things that makes creation and science so exciting. It's not just the science part of it. I mean, I'm a scientist. I love science. I think that's fantastic stuff. But you can use it as a tool to help people understand that God's Word is true from the beginning and help them make sense of salvation. So please check out these resources, and thank you very much for having me on to speak.